Hi there, I'm Dan from Box Clever. Uh, today we're going to be talking about using psychographic techniques to uncover um, a, a hidden layer, um, looking at hidden personalities within your survey data. So clearly what we're talking about is quantitative data um, and using psychographic um, ideas to um, bring the human side of quantitative data to life. But what I'm going to do just to illustrate what on earth it is that I'm talking about is I'm going to start off um, by talking about a qualitative um, scenario. So what I'd like you to do is imagine that you are viewing a qualitative focus group and the moderator has asked the respondents to introduce themselves one by one. And let's let's meet a couple of respondents. So let's meet uh, Keith. Now, Keith is uh, a fictitious respondent. He's not real, but he is based um, on the sorts of data that we see quite commonly um, in consumer research. And what we're going to do is understand a little bit about Keith. So first and foremost, what, what might we know about Keith straight off the bat? Well, we might know, for example, that Keith was recruited because he is a 45 to 54 year old AB male. Maybe he's from Norwich. Um, and if uh, in this particular piece of research, we have a consumer segmentation, then he's in our older family customer segment. And as he's introducing himself to our focus group, Keith might tell us a little bit about himself, maybe a bit about his personality, his background, his family, maybe about his um, his job. But there's an awful lot of stuff that Keith won't tell us. And really, let's be honest, that's the stuff that we're interested in. What we're interested in really is understanding the stuff that hit, that is hidden below the surface, but ultimately that might drive Keith's decision making and his behaviours. So that's what psychographics is all about. So what might Keith not tell us? All right. Well, let's be honest. Keith is never going to tell us this. So I'm a warrior. I resonate with disruption and independence. I'm highly task focused and high paced and I thrive on visual content. I guess you weren't expecting that. So that's the sort of stuff that Keith would not tell us in a focus group and absolutely wouldn't tell us in a quantitative survey. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, it's not the sort of thing that you'll tell people in a focus group, certainly with people that you've um, only just met. Number two, more importantly for our purposes, it's not the sort of thing that Keith would even be um, able to articulate or even aware of about himself unless he'd done a fair amount of personal development um, type of uh, investigations, just because it's the sort of stuff that sits below the level of consciousness. Let's meet another respondent. Let's meet Phil. So what do we know about Phil? So Phil was recruited into our focus group to be a 45 to 54 year old AB male. So you can see straight away that we might expect Phil to be quite a lot like Keith. Phil is also in our older family customer segment. So demographically very similar. And therefore, you might not be surprised to see that these two respondents end up in a similar focus group because they're kind of expecting to be um, behaving in the same way. So what might he, uh, what might Phil never tell us? Well, Phil might never say this. I'm an everyman. I resonate with connection and stability. I'm an extrovert and I'm highly agreeable. I thrive on auditory content. So what you can see straight away is that actually Phil is very, very different than Keith. So whilst they might look quite similar demographically and at a top line level, if you dig below the surface into some of these subconscious markers, the sorts of things that they might not be able to tell you, but are nonetheless true, they are very different. And therefore, those differences drive different mindsets, different preferences, different behaviours. So what we're talking about here is psychographics. Loosely defined psychographics is the study of personality, values, attitudes, interests and lifestyles. For the purposes of this presentation, we're particularly interested in those first two, personality and values. And the reason I say that is because when we're talking about attitudes, interests, lifestyles, people can pretty easily articulate that sort of thing. They're quite um, able to discuss and they're quite aware of the, uh, those sorts of preferences. What they're less aware of and therefore less able to articulate are things like personality and values because they sit at a more subconscious level. But nonetheless, those things drive quite powerfully uh, people's preferences and therefore ultimately their behaviours. But they happen below le the level of consciousness. And therefore, we need some tools to help us unpick those things because actually otherwise they will remain hidden within our survey data. So that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about a few models that we can utilise within a quantitative context for digging a little bit deeper into our data to unlock some of those personality markers, 
those psychographic markers that are driving decision making and therefore are really powerful for us to be able to understand. I'm going to talk about three of them. Firstly, we'll talk about archetypes and archetype alignment. Secondly, we'll talk about colors profiling, sometimes referred to as disk profiling. And we'll talk about the VARK model, V-A-R-K. None of these are new. They've been around, each of them, for quite some time. What's new is the way that we're applying them within a quantitative context. So that's the bit that we'll talk about. So I'll introduce each of them quite briefly in turn, but then we'll spend a bit more time talking about how we're applying them and how we can use them to activate quantitative data. All right. If you're familiar with archetypes, then this won't be new to you, but just a quick one. As a question, sometimes have you noticed how a particular story, a particular character, or even for our context, a particular brand, just seems to speak to us? Um, it's like it's like it's connecting with us on a level that we can't quite put into words, and yet it resonates. It, it, it feels intuitively um, correct to us. And that's what archetypes is. Archetypes is a way of bringing characteristics to life. Um, ultimately, they're a representation of, of universal human needs. States. That's what they are, actually are. And when I say that, what I mean is that whilst we all as individuals have different needs, we all as humans have universal needs. So these are hu universal human needs. And happily, you can plot these universal needs um, on, a, on a bit of a two by two matrix. So we will all sit somewhere on this sort of chart. So if you look top to bottom, what this um, model tells us is that we all have some level of need for at the top stability or order or status quo certainty is another way of describing it and on the flip side of that we all have some level of need for variety or freedom the ability to do something different so the ability to shake things up whilst our needs might change given on circumstances we'll all have a fundamental preference for one or two of the one or one or the other of those and therefore we'll sit somewhere on that dynamic um, from top to bottom likewise going from left to right we also have a need for connection, belonging, feeling part of something. That's on one axis, all the way through to on the other extreme, a need for independence, a need for significance, or a need for ego, as it's sometimes described. Again, depending on the situation, we might have a need for either of these, but broadly speaking, we'll have a preference for one over the other. And therefore, all of us will sit somewhere on this map. And therefore, we can use a map like this as a structure for making sense of a given universe. And in our context, that universe might be a given category or a given industry. And therefore, we, we can use this framework to identify well, where does our audience sit? And therefore, what are the needs that we should be playing to as a brand? Archetypes, therefore, is an overlay of the sorts of characteristics that a brand needs to bring to life in order to play to those need states. So for example, if your customer or if your audience, your, your target customer has a an overarching need for stability or order, then there are certain archetypes like the caregiver or the ruler that it would be sensible to play up in your brand positioning in order to play to those need states. Whereas if the opposite is true, if your target audience is all about variety and freedom, then you wouldn't want to be talking about a caregiver or a ruler ruler brand positioning. You'd want to be talking about an outlaw or magician brand positioning, for example. And the way this really brings to life, so, so you might recognize some of these characters, it, the, the fact that it's, it's, we're talking about universal need states means that you'll see these characteristics uh, plopping up time and time again in different types of um, consumer culture. So, for example, if you're looking on the left hand side at our Luke Skywalker or, or our Frodo Baggins or our guy from the Matrix, they're basically the same person. They're basically the same character. And we see them played out in movies. Or our, or our Dumbledore is basically the same as our Yoda. It's basically the same as our fairy godmother. It's basically the same as our Gandalf. They're all the same character. And they're brought to life because what they do is they represent a human need state. And therefore, we can all recognize these things intuitively. And that's what brands do, is they take this um, intuitive recognition as a shortcut for brand positioning. And therefore, if we talk about Nike being a hero brand, intuitively, people will know what that means and they can play to that. And if you're into um, heroics, then a Nike type brand will intuitively, therefore, um, resonate with you. If we talk about Disney being a magician or Virgin being a rebel or the North Face being an explorer, intuitively, we all kind of know what that means. And therefore, it's a nice shortcut, a nice proxy um, for brand character um, brought to life through the through the lens of a of a branding positioning so if we know that that's the principle and this is probably where you've seen archetypes in the past if you've seen it at all is in the context of brand positioning and that's all well and good but what we're talking about here is how we can use um, archetypes 
in a different way uh, quantitatively to do something new. And what we've been doing at Box Clever is using this at, not not as a not as a brand positioning tool per se, but actually as a means to an end. And what we're doing, which I think is quite interesting and quite different, is um, not just talking about the brand positioning, but talking about alignment across touch points. So if we know what our brand positioning is uh, from an archetypal perspective and how maybe respondents couldn't consciously um, bring that to life, but they would uh, recognize what our archetype positioning is. The question we can then ask is, well, are we bringing to life the same archetype in our advertising? And what about our customer experience? And what about our product experience? Do we have alignment across our touch points? Because what we know from lots of research is that where we have misalignment, if our advertising is playing to a slightly different archetype or our customer experience is playing to a slightly different archetype than our overall brand positioning, if in other words, we have misalignment, consumers know. It just feels off. They might not be able to put it into words. They not, might not be able to articulate it within a survey, but they know. It doesn't quite feel right. It feels inauthentic. And therefore, being able to use um, archetypes as a framework for identifying whether your brand touch points, whether your comms across different brand touch points intuitively feels right or feels off is extremely powerful. Now, we've, artic uh, we've developed um, a, a shortcut of the archetypes framework that has just been boiled down to a handful of simple questions that can very quickly and very easily be added, yes, into a qualitative piece if we're using it qualitatively, but more importantly for our purposes here, into a quantitative survey. So at no extra real time within a quant survey, we can drop in a series of questions that very quickly identify the archetype positioning of your brand, of your advertising, of your customer experience to bring that to life. Let me give you a short example from a self-funded study that we ran not too long ago. This was looking at um, brand positioning and alignment of brand positioning with brand advertising uh, in the broadband category. So let's have a look at an example of our first brand. Here it is. This is a, a long established brand within the category. Um, you can tell it's long established because it spikes on ruler. Um, so it's all about authority and being um, all about uplifting the status quo. That was the brand positioning. When we then showed them an advert, when we showed our respondents in our survey an advert for that brand, you can see that broadly speaking, it had a pretty good fit. Wasn't quite so high on Jester. Now, that's probably not surprising because the advert wasn't designed to be um, fun or silly in any way. So it under-indexed a little bit there. But to all intents and purposes, we had what we described as a pretty good um, brand alignment for positioning of brand and positioning of advertising. Let's have a look at a second example here. Now, this was for a, another brand within the uh, the broadband space, a slightly newer entry into the market. It had only been around for a few years at that point. When that brand first entered the market, it was quite new, quite, uh, quite different, quite disruptive, quite fun. So actually, when it first entered the market, its brand positioning was a lot more outlaw, a lot more jester than it is today. Today, it's a little bit more like the, the brand that we just saw, a little bit more ruler, a little bit more established. So that's its brand positioning. When we showed an advert, a recent advert from that brand to our respondents, this is what they said. Now, you can see here, unlike the previous slide, what we've got here is misalignment, quite significant misalignment. Ultimately, the advert here was still doing the job um, of where the brand was positioned a few years previously. It's still doing an outlaw jester job. So what this tells us is the advertising for the brand hasn't caught up with where the brand now sits. It's still lagging behind. The advertising is still playing to where the brand was sitting a few years ago. And that's quite dangerous because what it's ultimately saying is that brand's advertising was a little bit out of date, a little bit out of touch with where consumers are now thinking the brand sits. So an example of misalignment, which feels intuitively inauthentic, out of kilter with where the brand is and where it should be and how it should be communicating. And that's crucially not something that respondents would be able to tell us consciously in a survey, but which comes out subconsciously through the medium of brand archetypes as a, as a, as a measurement tool. So brand archetypes really is telling us, what do I need? What is it that I have as a need state that we can um, that we can unveil through archetypes, which might otherwise have remained hidden. So let's now move on to our next one, colors profiling. So colors profiling is something that's come out of the personal development space, but it's been around for quite a while. Like archetypes, we can plot it on a two by two. But whilst archetypes is talking about need states and preferences around need states, 
Colors profiling is talking about communication preferences. How do I like to communicate and how do I like to be communicated with? And we all again sit on a two by two matrix. This time we're looking at um, a communication in, in the context of task focused versus people focused on one axis and reserved or outgoing on the other axis. You might say introverted versus extroverted on the other axis. So we all sit in one of these four quadrants. Uh, so top left, if you're task focused and reserved, then you're an analyzer. All about the detail, close attention to detail, um, abides by rules and regulations. If you're top right, so you're task focused and outgoing, then we would call you the conductor. You're likely to take charge and make quick decisions. If you're bottom left, so you're reserved and people focused, then you tend to be easygoing, gentle, considerate of others. And lastly, bottom right, if you're people focused and outgoing, then you're our socializer. You're likely to seek out others and you like to influence people um, and, and quite a creative um, space to be to be living in. Now, we were interested in seeing whether we could take this model uh, that exists within the personal development space and apply it within a quantitative survey, almost like a segmentation, to unlock something that you wouldn't get through um, overt questioning alone. So we trialed this within um, a survey for a, for a, 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 a clothing retailer, and, and we were inter interested to see whether these four um, character types would play out in the preferences that people talk about within the context of clothing. So let's have a look at what we found. So first of all, our blues, our analyzers, we were hoping that what would come out from people who um, were mapped as the blues was that they would say things that identified them as being cautious, conscientious and calculating. And the good news is that's exactly what did come out. So they were more likely to agree with attitudes like uh, I live by the motto, buy better, buy less. I wait until a brand or a product is discounted or on promotion before I'm willing to buy it. If I can't get free shipping, then I'll wait, I'll, I'll shop elsewhere. So they're into the detail, which is exactly what we were expecting, exactly what we were hoping they would say. They're much less likely to say, I'm into social media, I'm into colors and prints when it comes to clothes shopping. I like to spend my time on creative activities. They're not creative at all. They're about detail. They're about being cautious, conscientious um, and, and calculating. So the short answer is this made perfect sense. This is exactly what we were hoping to see and is exactly what we did see. Onto our reds, our conductors, we were hoping that they would agree with the statements that gave them away as being dominating, direct and decisive. And indeed they did. So they said, I'm likely to buy clothes that I'll only wear once. I want the latest fashion trends. Desirable clothing brands are important to me. On the flip side, they were less likely to say, I choose clothes that are comfortable, I'm, my style is simple, effortless and low maintenance, or that family life is the most important thing to me. That's not to say that family life is not important, it's that they're less likely than other groups to say that. Our greens, who we were hoping, um, if, the, if the model was correct, would come out as being steady, stable and supportive, they absolutely were. So family life is the most important thing to me. That was the most likely thing that they would over-index on. They would describe their style as simple, effortless and low maintenance. And they said that they choose clothes that are comfortable. They're the least likely to say, my style is polished, sophisticated and put together. They're the least likely to say, I look for the highest quality. Remember, because they're all about other people, not about themselves. They're the least likely to say they wanted the latest fashion trends. And lastly, our yellows, who we were hoping would be inspirational, interactive and impulsive. They said, I'd like to spend my time on creative activities. I'd like to immerse myself in new cultures. I'm drawn to colours and prints. They were li the least likely to say uh, my style is simple or effortless, that my style is casual or that I, I choose my clothes that are age appropriate. So the short answer is. Our hypothesis that this colours model would bring to life the hidden personalities within this survey data was absolutely accurate. And again, this, um, these colours can be measured through a very simple, very short couple of questions that we can easily apply to any existing um, quantitative questionnaire to unlock some of this data that would otherwise remain hidden. So if our archetypes are about what do I need, our colours profile is about how do I need it? So then moving on to our final model, the VARC model. Now, this comes from the education space, and VARC is basically a way of understanding how do I process information? VARC standing for visual, auditory, reading and writing, and kinesthetic. So I have a preference for learning in one way over another. And you can kind of quickly identify this. If you were to ask somebody, uh, does this make sense to you? And they said, yeah, that sounds about right. Or yeah, that looks good. Or yeah, that feels right or yes, that makes sense, immediately there you're starting to get a sense of, well, which is their primary method of communication? Is it visual, auditory, reading, writing, and kinesthetic? Now, within our context, we can therefore start to use that within our quantitative surveys to identify within a given category, 
are our consumers most likely to be motivated by eyes, brains, or indeed taste buds if we're talking about FMCG, if we're talking about food or drink? So we can use the VARC model as a way of identifying, should we be dialing up um, the visuals? Um, should things be eye-catching and appealing? Or should we be dialing up the rationale, the logic behind prices, promos, ingredients and the like? Or should we be dialing up a more emotional, kinesthetic-based um, set of drivers? OK, so if archetypes are about what do I need, if colours are about how do I need it, then finally our VARC model is about, well, in what format do I need it? All right, let's wrap up. Coming back to Keith. So what do we know about Keith already? We know that he's a warrior. We know that he resonates with uh, disruption and independence. So those are the characteristics of a warrior archetype. We know that he's highly task focused and high paced. So he's a red. And we know that he thrives on visual content. So he's a V in our VARC model. So what does all that mean? Well, it means if we're talking about brand positioning, if we're talking about communication strategy, that if uh, Keith was our um, stereotypical target customer, then brands or products or positioning that are promoting togetherness are going to be absolutely lost on Keith. He's not interested. He's interested in brands or products that promote individuality. Messages that are focused on um, maintenance of the state status quo or people first messages, again, they're not going to wash with Keith. He's interested in goals, solutions, improvements, things that talk about smashing the status quo and moving to the next level. And lastly, communication formats that are focused on facts, figures, logic, they're going to be lost on Keith. He's interested in the big picture. He's interested in highly visual content. So we can use our different models of psychographic analysis to identify how we should be positioning, what should we should be saying, and how we should be saying it in a way that Keith himself, bless him, never would have been able to tell us either qualitatively or quantitatively. So I hope that's been useful. I'm going to pause there um, and I will now invite questions.